with shooting in, in Paradise Valley, Livingston, Bozeman. And for us, it's very important. We're, Mont we're born and raised in Montana. The story itself, talking out, is written by a Montana writer, set in Montana. So there was interest in us shooting in Canada and elsewhere, but it was, it was crucial for us to make it as as integral to where it came from as possible and where we came from. It's interesting. The film last year, like for example, Cut Back. It was a film in Cut Back. I think they took it up to Edmonton, right? right. Maybe they shot the, the, the penguin you see. Uh, I haven't it's seen it yet. Yeah. But, um, so there is, you know, some, some pressure, uh, you know, I guess maybe there are some great economic concerns up, up north, but um, how much of it is, is it for you, gentlemen, about, you know, the creative and artistic control of filming where you want, you know, how you want, and from your own locations? Is the creative control going to that, too, and just being able to have that? Well, you know, there's just a lot of trade-offs. Uh, we definitely have looked at budgets for our last two films that were Canadian budgets because the producer, producing, producers do have to pay attention to a bottom line and say, well, if we're getting X back on a dollar, you know, dollar spend, let's not, let's not ignore it. But, um, but the trade-offs have been in our favor by shooting in Montana in every case. I mean, um, there's also the, the Montana Film Office has worked with us a lot. There's, there's grants that help offset some of those those um, expenses, but you know, creatively, yeah, we, we know the terrain a lot better, so it's just a known a known quantity. Um, we can hire people we already have worked with and know, um, as opposed to filling quotas in, in Canada. We have to fill quotas, so those there is I, I think there is a creative control element that has a higher um, sort of we get more of it here than we would going elsewhere. Yeah, and for us, landscape is a character. Like the, the setting is is really crucial. We don't want it to feel generic. We feel like the more specific we are about a place, the more it'll actually trigger the member of the audience's memory of their own hometown, their own version. If you try to sweeten it up or generic it up, it goes south. So for us, it's really crucial, especially when you're dealing with a piece of literature that's set in Montana, to shoot in Montana. And like Andrew said, we know like literally the floor and fauna of this area, so we can incorporate all that stuff into the movie. We've created some cred, I think, over the last ten years making films here that we know we're respectful of, of towns and of ranches and, and, and location managers who can point to previous history, and that helps a lot with locals. Right. If we yeah, us being Montana filmmakers making a Montana story. A lot of people open a door where we're Hollywood filmmakers just trying to take advantage of a beautiful mountain or a tax break. No. Those doors might not open. You know, we've seen some stunningly you know, beautiful cinematography over the years in Montana. You know, we were in the blood. North Fork, I thought, you know, it was just it was breathtaking. You know, everything was just eye ravishing when you were seeing the text there. Um, and Slaughter Rule. So we've seen that, but how does that transpose to the film, you know, taking something that's so beautiful but that's also so mercurial, like the weather, mm -hmm. and all these variables that, you know, you can't manipulate and can't change. Right. Um, it, it is, is that beauty, can, I, can that be maddening at times and frustrating because it obviously tends to change so much, but what, what are some of the, the challenges, I guess, of filming in Montana as opposed to filming anywhere? Well, I, I think the challenges uh, are definitely that, that mercurial sense of, of light being ever-changing here. I mean, we all know how fast things change uh, on a given, any given day and particularly in transitional seasons. So um, I think the challenge is to be at the right space at the right moment and, and be able to get pretty complicated machinery together, uh, actors, cameras, and stuff, and, and get that before it goes away. Um, yeah. So we have to be... Yeah. We have to be um, flexible and yet at the same time kind of be able to uh, uh, anticipate what's going to happen with the light. Yeah, we with us, because we're shooting the winter in Montana and film that's 80% outside, we have shortened days where we, of daylight, basically daylight starts around 8.30 and ends around 5.30 on the best days. And so that's usually a film you shoot 12 hours and we're getting 9 to 10 hours of daylight. A lot of days with nothing to shoot at night. So it's, that's been a challenge. But on the other side, we, 
on the flip side of things, the production value that Montana gives us, like this morning we had snow coming down on, on our actors as if they woke up from a camp in the snow. And to create that snow wouldn't really fake, but it was, it was really happening. The camera knows it's really happening. And so and what we, we all the actors do. Well, the actors feel it. We sh we've been shooting in pretty remote locations. The actors pick up that energy. It's not a set or a studio. Or, and we also sort of said going in, we'll, we'll embrace what the day gives us. If it's snowing, we can adapt the script. Luckily, we're writers on this thing, too. So we can throw in a line about snow, or we can erase a line about no snow. You know. We just said, let's not try to, to challenge the film gods, but to embrace what they give us. And that's worked out really well. And a lot of it is, I mean, both because of our respect for the literary works we've been adapting, and also to create a, a playground in which the actors can feel like they just, they've you know, literally landed in, in the story. Um, as good as actors are, they often, I think that it really they, they can be they can be encouraged to, to get there easier if, if they believe the, the space around them and so we we've uh, we've really worked hard to put actors in our, our, our world into the real world as opposed to on a studio or, and, and settling for easier shots and we got an offhanded compliment the other day I overheard Matt Bomer talking to Josh Wiggins, um, as they're walking to set, and they, they often are kind of talking to each other in kind of like city slang, and he said, yo, this is as real as it gets, yo. <laughs> Matt said that too. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's kind of our goal, is make it as real as it gets. Yeah. yeah. And we saw that with, with, with Slaughter, with Slaughter Rule, as far as uh, you know, that experience, and keeping it as, as authentic as you could possibly make it. You know, and obviously, yeah. Going on the back lot, maybe from some of those things right there. But, um, so part of the that authenticity is must be the adaptability of any you know, spontaneity. Mm -hmm. So there have been scenes in you know in other movies in the past where um, the scene was sort of dictated by any other external variables like the weather. There was probably something we wouldn't even know, something new on us like yeah. writing in you know a line about snow. But right. does that happen in the previous two films as well? Yeah. Well, Slaughter Rule, we hit a record cold snap in Great Falls, and it shows up on screen. In fact, at one point we talked about on the DVD, like a thermometer that shows you how cold it was on the production day. So oh, look, this is, it's Hollywood. Kentucky, Illinois. Can you turn that off? Yeah. Um, you, you, you could take that. Yeah, we take a break. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. I don't know who that is. Um, so it, we had a record cold snap, and it was, it was actually almost too cold to shoot. Luckily, the wind didn't kick in, that would have been. But what's amazing is it shows up on screen. You see the breath, you see, you hear the crackle, and you see people shivering, and it made this film even more intense. I mean, part of the thing about shooting Montana, Montana's no joke. I mean, it's, the winters are fierce, they're long. Every season's really robust and has its challenges. And, um, and we don't, we're not after a postcard. We're not after, like, the ideal Montana. We're after the real Montana and the real experience for these people. And um, so if we kind of prepare for that, when it comes our way, we're, we're geared up and can capture it. And we got, we got, we've gotten, you know, sometimes it's been unforgiving to make that, to make that gamble with the weather, as in the case of, of Slaughter Rule, but on other hands, it gives you incredible gifts. There was a day on um, Blood when we were <coughs> shooting a huge, huge sequence, the whole cattle, the whole cattle stampede um, or cattle crossing roundup, and it was supposed to feel like the end of fall and, and um, the beginning of winter, like the first real cold day. We were shooting in August, and we got lucky because the winds came in from the north. It was about 45, 50 degrees that day, and it felt a lot colder on camera. Yeah. It was it was a two order. I mean, we couldn't have gotten a better day. Yeah, the film so, gods have yeah. been kind to us mostly. We got a blizzard two days ago. Yeah, but we weren't expecting it up in Highlight Canyon, outside of Bozeman. But it played beautifully on screen, and, and you can create snow with, with some effects, you can create it in post, but it doesn't look the same as when it's really snowing everywhere. And we took advantage of it. We jumped up and did a scene we were gonna do two days later because we wanted, we realized we were, it was gonna take us a lot more work to fake that snow that we were getting already. Right. So, and our actors luckily are good enough to make that jump on the day.
I'm always <coughs> intrigued by uh, maybe you call it provincialism, you know, whether it be music or art or other forms of culture. You know, what makes a, a folk singer like Malcolm Holcomb, who's from North Carolina, you know, what comes out of his sound that makes him North Carolina or John Gorka in the Midwest or Greg Brown? Or like, and I'm interested in that in film too. So if you were, you know, going back to Potomac, you know, in the 1970s, a much different Potomac than today, maybe it felt like it was two hours away from the yeah. at that time growing yeah. up. I was kind of interested in maybe, you know, how, you know, that experience kind of, kind of shaped you, Jeff, and mm -hmm. shaped you and kind of molded you and kind of casted you. That's a good question. Yeah, it is. I mean, it, it was it was beyond provincial. <laughs> when I where we grew up, um, and it, now it is kind of a bedroom community in Missoula. But right. as you say, uh, you know, 40 years ago, when we were gr growing up there, it was it was it was a very working class, lumber oriented, timber oriented community, and uh, we were at the end of the road, and we didn't have, um, you know, we often were left to our own devices. Um, I'm, my mother was a widow, so she was working, and, uh, and Alex were, and I were able to play in, in the woods, basically, and just subsist out there. We didn't have a TV, which I think helped a lot uh, us form a particular world sense that involved, involved comic books, literature, play, mm -hmm. outdoor play, and then films. We would go into town every weekend, and my, my mother was a cinephile, so we saw a lot of films as kids. Yeah, I mean, we grew up on a ranch, and it was kind of a, not a big ranch, but it was, it was certainly a dysfunctional ranch, because our father passed when we were little. And so we had to kind of fill in that role pretty young, so we were, we were fixing fence and chopping wood and do, working with horses, and then going to school, like, get up, it was like that classic little house on the prairie <laughs> experience. And uh, so we, we were outside in the elements a lot as children, and I think it, to answer your question, I think it plays in our films. I think it's something that really resonates to us. We're, when we're on set, you often look for and he's up somewhere, like in some cliff or craggy point, <laughs> looking at the, <laughs> at the, you know, the juniper berries and saying, maybe we can shoot through this. Yeah. And then it, it's the poetry of, of the films. Um, whereas I think if you grew up here, you wouldn't know any of that stuff, and so you wouldn't maybe own it. You know, it's interesting. So your mom's had a phenomenal career, you know, as uh, in film and, and literature. Um, what, you know, it's interesting how we, we kind of take on the, you know, some personal of our parents. And, um, and it seems like she was uh, a good woman, you know, and just is a good woman, a good person to be around, and, and a good influence. So tell me, you just said that she was a movie buff. Uh, so what are some of your early memories? And do you remember when, when, when she when she made her first film? Mm -hmm. Like in some of your memories growing up, I mean, it was a little bit of pride. You know, were you on the set? You would have been about five or six, right? Or a little older. Mm -hmm. Depends on which set. Yeah, yeah. Well, Heartland, for example. Well, I mean, our, our father, before he died, and whether we're making a documentary, or made a documentary about the, this poet, Richard Hugo, who was the head of the creative writing program at the right. University of Montana, and was the reason, actually, our family moved to Montana, because. Uh, my father was a literature professor. And so we grew up, and my dad also loved film and was, wanted to write films. And they tried to, went to Hollywood when we were very little and weren't very successful. But then after he passed on, my mother kind of took, took on that charge. And she worked first on a series of documentaries about Native American customs. So we were with her when they were shooting a lot of these docks, going to a lot of powwows and, and to reservations and to a lot of we were exposed to a lot of really fascinating ritual, and, um, and she, we were also she was editing. She made a docu another documentary about this poet, and with a woman named Beth Ferris about Richard Hugo, and they were editing it in our house when we were little. And so we would hear Hugo's poetry run forward and backwards because it was back on the day when you would edit on that steam back, which means on film, and you'd run the sound forward and run it backwards. So we used to be able to recite the poems backwards, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> We're not, we're not, we're not. Yeah, exactly. We're not, we're not. So that was early, and then then we were on the the set of Heartland, uh, the feature film that my mom produced. Oh, you're, you're good. Come on through. Come on in. Um, Do you want to talk about being on the set? Yeah, well, I think we were ten. Yeah. Um, when we went visited visited Harleton, and uh, we went a couple, for a couple of days of shooting, and uh, it was very exciting. It was, it was a very immersive 
film, immersive environment sort of for it. But um, very influential. Yeah, yeah I, I think it definitely stuck to our bones. Um, Andrew was an expert. He actually played a little girl. Mm -hmm. I got to wear a bonnet and a double for the, the girl who was playing the girl in a long shot. And, and uh, so I, yeah, I was jealous. jealous. I, that was my first real little prayer, little house in the prairie experience. So I got to wear a bonnet. So he, I've been in with a bonnet ever since. You know, it's interesting. I it was. Um, Where's your bonnet? Looking at uh, you know the Stone Boy, for example, that you know it was a, a very powerful amount of piece of filmmaking that didn't do well simply because people wanted Ghostbusters and all of me, and they wanted something obviously more lighthearted. Um, maybe it's a story film, of our life. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I was thinking. That's a film that may have never gotten its its, its fair recognition or attention right. simply because it would have been quote unquote would be too heavy, mm -hmm. uh, too somber, or too sore, too right. too towel, whatever you want to whatever adjective you want to use. Um, but there's something about the Montana experience we just kind of touched on that, that's, that makes it a uniquely kind of hardy and individualistically inclined population, yeah. as you guys know. So I, I think that the individualistically inclined population is the filmmakers, I mean, films about individuals, you know. So I think it's fascinating for me to see um, your cultural represent, representation of Montana. And my question would be, or, you know, you're probably obviously quite mindful of, of, of that representation because in some ways you're almost like, you know, ambassadors or whatever word you want to use. Um, in this era right now, as guys who are representing and depicting and portraying Montana. So um, are you sensitive to that? I'm not, I I think you are, but I wanted to kind of hear that in your own mind. Too. Very sensitive to it. I mean, we, we grew up around a lot of Montana writers, James Welch and, and Richard Ford, and, Jim Crumley and McWayne and Harrison and knowing them, reading them, and so being indoctrinated that way, but going up in Montana, you experience a lot. And Montana's a complicated state politically, and there used to be a lot, sort of a lot of xenophobia and a lot of fear of the other. I think it's gotten a, a lot warmer <laughs> in certain regards that way. But we're interested in, in people on the edge, people on the fringes, the marginalized. Um, those stories are people who really struggle, and so. A story, you know, a good story is someone who struggles really hard and it overcomes in some capacity this struggle. And um, I think Montana's overcome a lot of diversity in general. This, this as I said, this state is no joke. Um, but it makes for a certain hardy, stoic kind of person who's kind of can, can handle anything. Yeah, I think that that's well said. <clears throat> I mean, I think that, you know, if you look at our weird cross genres, I mean, we've made a football movie a Native Western, a Native American Western, and this is a hunting drama, not that that's its own genre, but in each case we're trying to excuse me, get past uh, a, a cliche or get past a stereotype about what kind of person is a hunter, what kind of person plays football, what kind of, what that, and what that, that element of the culture really is like, and, um, and find stories that are, that are inside that that seemingly known world is our, is our hope, and find stories about real lives that people are living in, in places that people can write off. You mentioned you know, James Walsh. Now, as far as I know, he was a family friend. Yeah. Um, and, and I you know, read a couple bits and pieces as one to see if those were true. That you, you, said, you sure first were. read um, Winter and the Blood when you were in high school. Yeah. Maybe you didn't know that he had a lot of those emotions that he didn't seem outwardly, I guess in the surface appearance, that he, he was quite kind and mellow, but then I think I saw something a quote or two that basically said that after you read Winter Little Blood, you said, wow, this guy's a, a more intricate, complicated human human being than, than you knew him. But maybe you could just tell me a little bit about that relationship. Okay? Sure. To hear more about that. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that, that was, that's a fascinating part about growing up around writers, is that you, their, their personalities don't always match Necessarily, their their work or the, the, the ferocity is a word we always use with, with Jim. The ferocity of his, of his imagination was, was so was so strong and so pronounced, and, and and he was on the surface seemingly a much milder guy. But you know, once you got to know him, and you could you could see what if he that that, that was in there, and it and it's this beautiful, I think, dichotomy among people who are, who are interior like that, who are writers who. 
who have, um, have, have expressed, expressed that stuff in a way. So um, I think film, our task with film is to get inside that kind of imagination and make it available to you know, non-readers and other people. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, Jim, we knew him from a very early age. A lot of Christmas, a lot of Thanksgivings with Jim and his wife Lois. He was a wonderful, sweet, warm person, very funny. He's also the type of person who spent a lot of time listening. A good writer, a good storyteller is actually quiet because they're absorbing information, behavior, stories. And so that, that was the kind of thing, like on Still Waters, you know, run deep with, with Jim. When you knew him, he would come and connect with you as a child, as a teenager, as an adult. He was very interested, generally interested. And then you actually get to the page and it was just like this whole interior life of this, these characters. It's so deep and so moving and so true. So it, it's kind of a, it makes sense, but you didn't expect it to be ready. Being cognizant of time, maybe we'll hold it to five more minutes. Or sure. Yeah. 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 And then we can do one question, later. and then we can get together. Um, uh, this is interesting, and I don't know if um, you guys have discussed this, but I find it fascinating like, the dynamics of a brotherly relationship, mm. and you know, to work in if there's, um, you know, obviously there has to be some type of cohesiveness, and, and at a time in a relationship that obviously uh, I have brothers that can be quite a common. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering maybe about the, the, the dynamics of how about how you two work, you know, is there a little bit of tension sometimes, love hate, like love hate, you know, just uh, I'm kind of interested in you right intrigued by how how you kind of delegate kind of tasks among each other and, and, and about your relationship, you know, on the right. side or on the side. Well it's all of the above. <laughs> right. I mean, everything you just said is accurate. We love hate, like love hate, uh, respect, kindness, yeah. respect, respect, kindness, admiration. You know, I mean, there's, I, I know I have moments where I'm just like so glad that he's he, he's taking the lead and just is going after something that he sees uh, from from take to take. And then, I mean, the the hardest part we by the time we start shooting, we're actually pretty we're pretty unified. We 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 fought out a lot of the stuff. It's, before we get to the set. Um, some of that will come back in the edit, as we know. I mean, the edit gets a little bit, because then you're fighting over one little tiny bit of a choice. But on the set, in yeah. filmmaking, we, especially when we have a little more resources, we definitely uh, are, are trying to honor each other's ideas at all points. Uh, sometimes we will talk about it, uh, and, and you know, try to talk each other about it. But generally speaking, if someone sees something they want to go after, it, We've learned to trust that there's a reason that's probably a good reason. Yeah, I mean, film is such a collaborative medium that it's kind of great to be a collaborator from the get-go on the script, and then coming in as co-directors. We we've worked on everything really hard, very thorough, more than I think we alone. And sometimes you, what's great about collaboration is you get to somewhere that neither would, one of, would have, neither one of you would have gotten to on your own. Sometimes it's just that, that friction, that conflict of searching for the right thing. I see something, he sees something. As long as we can communicate what each are seeing, then that communication turns on light bulb to something that's unified. And once we're unified, a unified front's pretty hard to drive a wedge between, so we can actually be pretty, pretty uh, clear to our other collaborators about what we're after. Um, and so you get this gold in collaboration that's beyond the sum of the parts. Um, that's, that's when it's really cool when that happens. And we have a very similar background, obviously, twins, growing up, isolated. So we did this as kids. We, we made super eight movies, we did comic books, we'd take turns doing panels. So we've been collaborating all our lives. It's just the, the scale's gotten bigger and the paycheck's gotten a little, a little <laughs> bit better. But, uh, yeah, it's been flat -like. <clears throat> well, I'll end this little session with a very easy question. I'm just, this is, I'm saying that facetiously, this is kind of abstract, but, uh, you know, you know, Andy Warhol said that art is anything you can get away with, right? And I was just reading this biography of Jefferson, and he said that art was the act or attempt of a man trying to die sane. Somewhere in between, maybe there's a truth, you know, but I was wondering in your own, you know, in your own words, in a very abstract way, you know, what is, what is art? Yeah, what is art? Uh, wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think you know. For me, art is is just that that limbness between, between 
terror and beauty. Once again, that's not my, that's a, that's a, a Roku line, right? Every angel was terrifying, every angel was terrifying, and, and, uh, and so I feel like we're, we're trying, at least I'm always trying to approach something honestly and, and as, realist, as realistic as possible, but through, a, I'm a poet, you know, at, at the heart, so it's like a, lyri a lyricism. I think art to me is a, is a lyrical way of seeing the world um, and being honest about what we see. And I, I would say that that's a beautiful definition. I would, for me, it's almost the idea of, of communication. That you can actually try to capture a feeling, a, a moment, an emotion, write it down, then get a bunch of people together to, to capture it on film, then project it on a screen, and have someone watching it feel that first feeling you felt, trying to map it. And so the idea of that, that ricochet in, into connection me is art, that you actually move somebody via something that moves you. That, that's the goal. Beautiful. Thank you guys. Thank you. Good Thank questions. You and we can, uh, you know, we can pick this up again. Oh, of course. I think right now we should. Yeah, yeah, when yeah, when you do the edit over in Missoula, could we, could we come over for that? Well, we're